In this video, we're gonna cover some extremely important elements to success in your liquids program. Selecting the proper salt to mix your brine, how we need to mix our salt brine to make sure it does not freeze, how to know when our brine is mixed correctly. And finally, we're gonna cover the benefits and things to look for when selecting the icing additives. When selecting salt for mixing brine, it's extremely important to ensure that you find salt with a purity rating of at least 95%. The reason this is important is because when we're mixing salt and water, the less impurities in that salt, the faster our brine's gonna mix and the less maintenance and problems we're gonna have with our brine mixing machines. You may think it's more convenient to simply use whatever bulk salt you have in the bin, and it is possible that the bulk salt you're using is pure enough to use for making salt brine. However, I can tell you without a doubt that using impure or high impurity salt is going to cause more headaches than it's going to save you by the convenience because you're going to have to clean out your brine maker constantly, you're gonna have slow mix times, and you're gonna have sprayers that get plugged up on a regular basis. Another factor in selecting your salt could be the gradation. Now, as long as your salt is pure, it really doesn't matter if you're using powdered salt or if you're using blocks of salt. But one thing to keep in mind is that the larger the gradation of your salt, the slower your brine is going to mix. So if time is of the essence, look for a salt with a smaller gradation for faster mixing times. Do not use treated salt to make your salt brine because it has multiple chloride types in it. Having multiple types of chlorides may affect the density and will be very difficult to confidently know when your salt brine is at the 23.3% eutectic point of salinity. Now that you've selected your proper salt, we need to know how to mix our salt brine and where to mix it to. So mixing salt brine is very simple in a VSI by Boss brine mixer, but we wanna make sure we're mixing it to what's called the eutectic point every single time. So what exactly is the eutectic point? What the eutectic point definition actually is, is it's the lowest possible freeze point of salt brine. Specifically speaking, the eutectic point of salt brine is 23.3%, which is 2.28 pounds of salt per gallon. So essentially, if you're making a 100 gallon batch of brine, it's gonna take approximately 228 pounds of salt to achieve that. That being said, keep in mind the purity rating of that salt. If your salt is only 90% pure, it's going to take 10% more pounds of that salt to achieve that 23.3% because the impurities do not mix into solution and actually contribute to your mixed salt brine. It's extremely important to mix to this level, not only because it's the lowest possible freeze point, but also because the eutectic point of brine happens to be the most stable mixture. The stable mixture allows you to store it in solution for long periods of time without fear of fallout. You may be thinking that if 23.3% brine is good, that 25 or 26% must be even better. However, the contrary is true. Actually, what happens on the eutectic point curve is that the freezing point slowly drops until it hits eutectic point, and then it immediately spikes up to a very high point. So with eutectic point being 23.3%, at just 26.5%, brine freezes at 32 degrees, just like water. Long story short, don't oversaturate your salt brine. It could have very bad effects on your liquids program. So now you know what the eutectic point is and where you need to mix to, but you may be wondering, how do I measure that? There's two simple ways to do this. The simplest way is with a manual floating hydrometer. This is simply a glass vial that has numbers labeled inside of it that floats in the salt brine and tells you what your salinity is at. You have to be careful with these measuring tools because they don't take into account the temperature of the liquid. As a liquid decreases in temperature, it becomes more dense, thereby throwing off the reading of that hydrometer system. So for example, if you were mixing your brine outside, you stored it overnight, that brine got down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and you put a manual hydrometer in there that's typically calibrated for 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna have a way over reading of the salinity of your salt brine. And that's again, because the density of that liquid increases as it becomes colder. The great thing is the VSI by Boss has a solution to this. We have our digital salinity reader system that connects to a Bluetooth app on your phone and shows you your salinity of your brine in real time as you're mixing. The great thing is it also adjusts for changes in temperature. So regardless of the temperature of that brine and regardless of any impurities in that brine, it's going to give you the correct reading every single time. And as we discussed, hitting the proper eutectic point of your brine is extremely important. One of the most common areas of failure for contractors is improperly mixed brine. Whether you're making it yourself or buying it from a supplier, you always wanna verify that your brine is mixed correctly. While salt brine alone is a very powerful tool, 
Adding additives to your salt brine mixture will help supercharge your liquid operation. Essentially, these are ready-made additives made to mix with your salt brine that offer a lot of benefits. The first thing that these additives typically do is lower the working temperature. This is achieved by the addition of either calcium or magnesium chloride. While sodium chloride, which is salt brine, creates what's called an endothermic reaction, drawing heat from its environment to cause melting. Exothermic chemicals, such as calcium and magnesium chloride, actually create their own heat. This allows them to work at lower temperatures and gives the brine an overall much lower working temperature and faster speed of melting. In addition, these ready-made additives contain tackifiers. It's extremely important that when we're putting an application down that it stays where we put it, especially if we're pre-treating far ahead of a snow event. Another benefit to these liquid additives is that they contain corrosion inhibitors. These corrosion inhibitors help to protect your equipment, your trucks, your spray systems, as well as your client's properties. That's a 360 degree win for your clients and your own company. A lot of these additives also contain polymers. What these polymers do is they help create a traction aid even before the snow and ice has melted. While liquids work extremely quickly, there's always that time period between when you've applied the product and when it's melted to bare pavement, where you'd like to keep the surface as safe as possible, and polymers help to accomplish this. The last thing that these additives contain is organic matter. This could be in the form of carbohydrates or lignans. So what these do is actually help molecularly change the water so that if and when the water does freeze back into ice, it does not freeze into smooth ice. So when is the best time to use salt brine additives? In our operation, we always use additives with our brine. We find that the benefits to our clients and to our level of service far outweigh the cost of putting these additives in our brine. So we would always suggest at least using a 95-5 blend, that being 95% salt brine, 5% additive, when applying either pre-treat or post-treat. Anytime the temperature falls below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, we'll always recommend using at least a 90-10 blend. Taking it a step even further, when you're dealing with sensitive infrastructure or areas close to buildings or on sidewalks, we'll recommend bumping up to an 80-20 blend. So that's 80% salt brine, 20% additive. The reason for this is because of all the benefits we listed of those additives, we wanna get the maximum number of those benefits when we're close to buildings and critical infrastructure. This will help ensure that your client's properties remain in good shape and also help ensure that those highest traffic, most high liability areas are best taken care of. When shopping for a brine additive, we want to find a product that is consistently made. We also recommend finding something that's locally and readily available. There's no reason to buy a product that has to be shipped across the country just because you heard it's good. Most markets have high quality, consistent brine additives available in them. Other things we look for are products with a high percentage of active ingredients. This is typically indicated by the recommended blend rates. If you see an additive where the manufacturer recommends putting it 50-50 with brine, I can promise you that's not an additive you wanna buy. The reason for that is because their product is mostly watered down, causing you to have to use more so that they can sell more product. A good additive should only have to be mixed up to 20% additive to the brine ratio in order to get the best results. We also wanna look for additives that are ideally colorless and odorless. These aren't available in all markets, however, they're becoming more readily available if you're working in sidewalk areas or areas that are near buildings, we strongly recommend avoiding additives that are made from beet or molasses byproducts. These are some of the most common additives in the industry, and they're fairly inexpensive. The problem is that they typically smell bad and they definitely will track into buildings. Don't get me wrong, they do work extremely well. If it's your only option, simply avoid using them by entryways and on sidewalks and you'll probably be okay. But with colorless, odorless additives becoming more readily available, we strongly suggest trying to source one of those locally. Another pitfall is that contractors look at the price tag of a ready-made brine additive, and they decide that they're just going to use straight calcium, magnesium, or well brine. You're not going to have anything to help prevent corrosion, you're not gonna have anything to help prevent refreeze, and you're not gonna have anything to help tactify the product to the pavement. To explain what I mean, I'll tell you a story. So many years ago in our own snow operation, we decided to experiment with some straight calcium chloride blended with our salt brine. The reason we did this is because it was about a third of the price of the ready-made de-icing additive we had been using. And we knew that it would help it work to lower temperatures and we thought we might get away with not needing to pay for the more expensive additive. In practice, what actually happened is we, we made an 80-20 blend, 80% 80 salt brine, 20% calcium chloride. And we went and applied it to all of our properties. They all melted off extremely quickly and were down to bare pavement. So we were excited that we got good results for less money. The problem is that shortly after that, all of the lots froze back over. 
This is a phenomenon we call flash refreezing. This occurs when melting happens too quickly, the product dilutes to a point where it's no longer below the freezing point of either the ground or air temperature, and it flash freezes back to the surface. Because calcium or magnesium chloride or well brine don't have the organic matter, don't have the carbohydrates, they don't have the other features that help prevent them from refreezing, this can happen fairly often and very unexpectedly. So make sure to select the right product. We've now laid a foundation for you to have great success in your liquids program. From how to select your salt for making brine, to how to mix to the eutectic point and what the eutectic point is, how to properly measure your brine with properly calibrated instruments, and how additives should be selected and how they'll benefit your business. This groundwork should get you off to a great start. Keep following along with our videos to elevate your liquid IQ.